Ladies and gentlemen, it is BenjaCon 2021. I am so glad to be getting this started up with you. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you all for joining. Uh, we've got a great lineup of guests, and we're going to go ahead and get it started with a quick introduction. Um, I am your host, Mr. Benja of the ADD Experience, and I am going to be um, I'm going to be meeting with a great group of creatives this week. The first one we have up is the Tiny Nightmare, Aubrey Miller. She's a, a, an illustrator, marketer, great creative mind that I've known for uh, several several years. We met on the con scene. We'll definitely get into all that. I want you to ask all your creative questions. Uh, make sure you, you know, jump in and let us know what you think. Um, even if you're watching this after the fact, you know, make sure you leave a comment and talk it up. We'll keep this thing interactive. And we are, let's go ahead, let's just go ahead and jump into it. She's here and she's ready to do this thing. All right. We're going. Hey, how are you? Aubrey, I am doing excellent. Um, <laughs> Don't die terrible, on me. Yes. <laughs> Terrible that my my very first thing to say to you is uh, be choking up with uh, <laughs> a little water in my throat there. <laughs> well, it's okay. I'm used to it. So, you know, people don't really know what to say to me a lot of times, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's, it's good to see you. Um, I know during these pandemic times, everybody's, you know, not as, uh, they haven't been seeing as much of each other, but... During the con times, uh, during the con season expos and things like that, I always used to get together with people and meet up with them. And you are one of my fond memories from the whole con scene. So I was like, you know what? I got to have her on. <laughs> it's so crazy how that happens, right? Like things that we do years ago kind of catch up with us. And like we each evolve, but we're each following our path. And then we kind of find each other again. So I think it's really cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you all for uh, joining us down below in the comments. This is an interactive live thing. So if any of you have any questions or anything uh, you want to say or add to this, let, let us know and, um, and we'll, we'll call you out. Thank you. We got Bob Lunetta, Old Harbor, Will Castro is rad, Darth Severus Kirk, all these awesome people. Thank you very much. So, um, Real quick, how, how have you been? I just want to start this off with some general chatter and let us know how you are in this time and how are things? Um, I've been good. I've been very tired specifically the past few days, gearing up for the premiere of Fear City. Uh, we wrote a song for the end of the credits and filmed a music video for it over the past week. Um, so that's been fun and exciting and something I've never done before. Awesome. Um, yeah. But I've been good, you know, like, I think COVID was actually good, like, unpopular opinion. COVID was actually really good for me um, in that I got to, like, sit and work on my creative projects. And I got to put more brain power into them and more energy into them. And I just got to kind of relax for a minute. And that was really good for me. So I am just kind of coming out of that and, like, kind of seeing, like, the fruits of that labor kind of come out, which is really fun and really exciting for me. Yeah, definitely. Um, I know it is an unpopular opinion, but I think a lot of people have had, they, if they were creative, they've started creating something new in a different way during this whole experience. So um, I'm very glad that you're, you're seeing the good creative side come out of this. So, yeah, like in the beginning you, of the pandemic, um, I wasn't really sure what was going to happen. And I don't know, I just kind of leaned into my creativity. Definitely, definitely. So let us let people know who you are. Like, you're a general creative. Um, I saw I saw on your uh, on your profile said creation is my salvation. So this is all about creatives uh, here. Yeah. I want to know. Um, I, I just want to know what who give them a little overview of who you are and how how you are creative. How I am creative. Um, I mean, it's it's actually kind of funny because I just realized, like, maybe in the past year and a half, that actually my job is a creative job. Like, my day job is also creative. 
Um, I was like, I want to do art for how I make my money. And then I was like, oh, I've been doing that for years, actually. So um, yeah, I, I do graphic design and I do illustration and I do interior design and I do exterior design, um, layout design for um, Amplified Ill Works. I do basically everything that you see, everything you interact with, the brand manager for that. Um, and that business has really allowed me to grow as a person. You know, like I think you mentioned um, earlier, like on the little things as marketer, right? So they hired me to do marketing initially. And then as art over the course of the years they're like can we have you do our art can we have you design our interior spaces can we have you do this and that and I was like yeah sure I mean I guess so you know like being really insecure about it and really scared about it and and the owner Alex really actually was the one who like kind of brought me out of my shell and was like no you're good at this like I need you to do this and I was like oh okay and then because of him I've just kind of gained confidence which is an awesome gift to give someone actually no, that's a uh, that's very impressive. I like the. It, it seems so natural to you, um, to us, that you would be doing this, uh, just looking in from the outside. But you know, you say there was a little bit of uh, you know trepidation. You you know you maybe weren't sure about it, um, but you you seem to be doing it doing it very well. What uh, what was that transition like? Because you, I met you in more of the promotions marketing side of things. And I always thought you were a creative person, but I met you in more of the, you know, marketing promotion side of things. And now I'm seeing more of your creative side. What was that transition like and what got you thinking more in that way so that it did come out and people could recognize it? So I think actually, like, I've always been creative and I've always been, I've been doing art since I was little. I was like a published writer when I was 14. Um, I've been mm. painting since I was like 12. Um, you know, I've like always done these things. And then as I got older, I was like, okay, Aubrey, you need to be like a serious adult now and like figure out how you're going to make money and what are you going to do with your life? And, you know, so I have two degrees from SDSU. One is in journalism with an emphasis in advertising and one is uh, anthropology with an emphasis in sociocultural studies. Right. So I'm learned, right. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh... Awesome. But really, like, I kept coming back and leaning on my creativity in every single job that I had. And even when you met me, you know, I was doing promotions and I kind of like tried to like leave the creative stuff behind because I felt like that was just kind of like a weird pipe dream kind of idea. And um, but as I as I got older, I just kept leaning on my creativity. And actually, that's what has got me more success is actually just leaning into what I'm naturally doing kind of have been drawn to my whole life which makes sense right obviously yeah. but you know we you kind of have to break that barrier of society and 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 letting us know like it's not just sitting in an office and making money or whatever right yeah definitely um so was it a bit of um do you think you held yourself back at all Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. I like basically started, I hadn't painted for eight years. And then I started painting again. Um, I was actually kind of hitting a creative block with myself with my clients work. And I just started painting again while I was living up in the Bay Area because I was kind of stuck up there and didn't really know very many people and started painting again. And then it kind of got the wheels turning again in me creatively. And I was able to produce more creative thoughts and projects for my clients and then it also just kind of erupted something inside of me as well um to do more of my own work and I realized I need my own work to be able to create for other people because otherwise I'm gonna hit a wall and I'm not gonna be able to constantly be creative if I'm not doing it for myself interesting interesting I, I don't disagree I just didn't think of that like right away um but no that is a that is very key, you know, to make sure your current energy, your creative energy is flowing within yourself and then it can flow better to others. I, I think that's what I'm getting, right? Yeah, yeah, basically. I mean, I think I'm still kind of figuring it out myself. So, you know, it's kind of a therapy session, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So technically, um, I, I remember you first with the illustrations. Like you said, you were doing yeah. some marketing work. Um, the empanada place, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. Was doing a lot of, yeah, yeah, I remember all that. 
Um, and, you know, some flyer designs. Uh, we definitely uh, kind of vibed on that level of uh, doing stuff for the marrow. Um, so that was all cool. Yeah. So the the technical illustration, um, not not technical, but the illustrations that I saw. So were those like, okay, I have this project. I need to, I need someone to do it. I'll just do it myself. Or were you thinking that I'll just do this temporarily until I can find another artist? Both kind of, right? So it was like, oh, I need this. So I'll just do it. I, and, and then I was always looking for like somebody who had like a degree in graphic design or went to school for it or went to art school, you know, or whatever. But I was always like, I don't have a degree in this. Like, why is what I'm producing better than like what these people I'm trying to hire to do, do? And then I was like, I was like, I never even went to school for this. Like, come on. And then they're like, we want like $45 an hour. And I'm like, I'm not going to hire you to do, to produce this though. And I was like, I was like, maybe I should just do this. Like, I was like so I just kind of yeah. was like, okay, well, if these people are getting $45 an hour, I was like, dang. I was like, all right, cool. <laughs> so, nice. and, and not, not to knock anybody or anything like that. I was just like, I was just like, it was more so like I, it, again, like holding myself back where I just didn't really believe in myself, I guess, until I was kind of faced with that reality of, oh, you might not suck at this, actually. Right, right. <laughs> that is awesome. That is awesome. Um, I, I know uh, I was talking with um, Eddie, uh, who we'll have uh -huh. on um, a little later in the week, and I also met him through you, and I found out he was a graphic designer as well. So this is all one weird little creative graphic design thing. Um, I don't know. Did you know that? About Eddie? I'm sorry. You cut out really fast. What did you say? Uh, Eddie, um, who yeah. I met through you. Um, he's a graphic designer as well. And I totally didn't know that when I met him. I just found that out pretty recently, actually. Yeah, yeah. So I haven't done any like design projects with him or worked with him as an artist much, but he did hire me actually. How I met him was through friends and he hired me to do work for this bar he used to own called The Foundry. Mm -hmm. And so we um, co-created on that as a, as a restaurant project. Okay. You know, I, uh, uh, Jeff, the guy who did all the photography on the wall when uh, the foundry opened uh, the, uh, the video game. Yes, I don't know if yes. you remember that, the character that were photographed. Yes. Um, I'm actually having him on as well. So I'm getting this whole comic con vibe going back <laughs> again and just getting everybody talking. So this is, this is wonderful. I, I totally love it. So we're getting the um, band back together. Basically. Uh, uh, Raph too. Raph is uh, coming through. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you ever met Nasty O, uh, the eight bit boy. No, I did not. No, that doesn't uh, sound familiar. He's a uh, he's actually a friend of Mega Rand. Um, uh, and I I ran into him at Comic Con, and he's going to be on a little later too. So, so yeah, it's all it's all going to be great, awesome, fun, and. And, like, you know, I may have met him, but I was always running around like a chicken with my head cut off at all the nerdcore shows that, like, I barely got to talk to people. I barely got to interact very much. Like, I, I just feel like I met people and it was like, hi, blah, blah, blah. Okay, bye. So, yeah. I mean, maybe, but, yeah, it was crazy. So, how did you get into that world, by the way? The uh, whole nerdcore scene? <laughs> So I was actually hired to do the marketing for a website called the Gamer Girls, and mm -hmm. uh, they wanted to not be just, like they kept getting knocked for just having pretty girls holding controllers, like game controllers, and uh, like in all their photo shoots. Right. And I was like, well, they actually are all like gamers, and that was like the thing, but it wasn't really being put out there in the right way. Like the messaging wasn't there. And so I was like, well, you know, let's start an all-girl um, competitive gaming team and let's do, you know, like, we'll do live streams on Twitch and we'll sit there and, and you know, we'll show them that it's not just a pretty face with a game controller to get attention. Like, they're actually doing what they say. And um, 
And so then that kind of evolved into I'll do live events with our models so people could actually meet them. And I'll set up like, we set up these crazy like gaming tournaments. I don't know if you remember that where we had like consoles yeah. and stuff. And we had like, yeah, we had that going. And, um, and that was just to introduce people from the website to the models so that they knew that they could actually like kick their ass at video games. Um, yeah, yeah. And then I was like, well, we need some live entertainment. And then it was actually the owner, Eric, that introduced me to Nerdcore. And I was like, okay, cool. And I had worked in music already. And I had, like, you know, been just a punk rock kid. And, and I actually really fell in love with the genre because it's very punk rock in nature, right? It's, uh, like, the messaging of, of the music. It's like, we like what we like. We don't care what anybody else thinks. There's a lot of, like anti-racism messaging there's a lot of pro-women messaging there's a lot of just like internal um up uplifting messaging i think as a whole and i think it's really like positive scene um and so i really fell in love with it and i actually i had one rule for the owner of that website and i told him that i would continue to work for him but he could mm -hmm. never date any of the models and i think i remember that one of those discussions yeah. something like that yeah <laughs> Yeah, well, because, like, as soon as that happens, everything kind of falls apart, and then, like, there, there's favoritism, and, like, blah, 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 you know, and it just doesn't work out. And so, of course, he did, and actually, I think they're still together, and they're living in Vegas, and they have a very happy, beautiful life, but um, I was like, I'm going to stick to that boundary, and I kind of stopped working with them, but I had people hitting me up asking to continue doing the Nerdcore shows, because it was, like... I had multiple people um, contact me saying that it was the only time that they felt comfortable going out to a bar and talking to people because it was people who had similar interests or they were like-minded and, you know, like otherwise you're just going out to a bar and people just think you're kind of a fucking nerd and, you know, whatever. <laughs> and this is, this is way before it was cool to be a nerd, by the way. And, um, <laughs> And it, it was just, it became a community and I was really honored to be able to give that to a lot of people. So I continued that and I continued booking nerdcore shows and, you know, just continued growing that scene. And it was really fun. And I got to meet a lot of people like you and introduced to Eddie and, and Raph and so many people. I met so many people through that. And it just, to this day, you know, literally to this day, like literally right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. So, so yeah, that's kind of that. So in all of that, you're, you're just uh, creating, building, you, you're going with this energetic flow that you've got going on. How much of this is planned and how much are you just riding the wave of your creativity? Um, I would say there's a really good plan in place that never works out. <laughs> um, and it just kind of, Everything that, since I was a kid, I would be like, oh, I wish I could do this for my life. But, you know, that's a bad idea. So let's do this plan. Um, and then everything I wanted to do in my life just kind of keeps happening. And I keep having those opportunities. So it's, um, I keep planning against myself, I guess. But ending up in the spot where I really want to be, if that makes sense. <laughs> no, totally. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. Uh, people keep using this quote and don't really know who it comes from. But... Uh, when uh, the quote is, um, you know, if you, uh, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. And that, you now it's from Mike Tyson, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, everybody, that's, it's such a classic line. Um, and I love planning things out, trying to get things in order, but then, you know, reality kind of happens. I didn't expect to be doing this thing over Instagram. Um, I had this other whole plan set up where I was like, well, you know, I'll set up a website and then there's going to be this live chat thing going on. It'll be cool. And and then they kind of turned to Twitch, which kind of turned to Facebook, which kind of turned to Instagram. Uh, when my friend from um, the show versus business podcast, he was on Instagram and we were talking and it just kind of became a thing. And so suddenly I was like, crap well, let's just get the, get everybody together and kind of do what we were doing the past couple years, but in a digital form and bada boom, bada bing. So I totally get the the plan and then adjust accordingly. It's... Yeah, totally. It's, and, and I think it's important to, to remember to not stick to your plan too much, right? Like have an idea mm -hmm. of a plan, but 
be flexible and accommodating to what the universe is kind of trying to push you towards. Yeah, definitely. Now, are you, it, it seems like it, but now I want to ask here, how are you doing with this whole digital landscape? Because it's changed what we think of creatives, creativity, art, marketing, et cetera. And it's all coming into this weird place now where somebody like me who doesn't want to be online is suddenly doing interviews like this. So how do you think it's, how, how do you feel about this whole interactive online landscape now? I think it's really cool, right? Because, you know, we always talk about how the story, like there's always that whatever saying idea that it's the story of the artist or the art that sells more so than the art itself a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And I think this allows people to be able to tell their stories more and you get to know the people behind what the creation is and you're able to really get to um, like, like from a viewer perspective right you're able to like really get to know a lot more about what makes that person take and appreciate their art more I think from an artist perspective I think that it forces you to do a bunch of different things you never thought that you would have to learn how to do um as somebody in marketing like I'm I'm pretty familiar with a lot of those things but I can understand somebody who just wants to draw pictures and paint and is really good at it where that might be really overwhelming where you have to keep up all these social media landscapes you have to you still have to network you still have to do you know digital showings you have to do in-person showings you have to do like all of this extra work because you can be in multiple places at once right so yeah. i i think it's crazy um it's a lot of work to keep up with especially for one person um i think that I'm really excited to see how it changes. I, I have a friend who's an anthropologist who a couple years ago told me that we are in the middle of the end of, of the ancient age. That we are, like right now, we are transitioning from the ancient age into the future age. So like think about like a pencil or a pen, right? Like we don't really use those very often anymore. And that is the ancient writing mm. tool for thousands of years, right? So... So we're transitioning so hard into the future right now. So I just see all of these things that are popping up and coming up is it's, it's this big chaotic mess until it fully transitions over to that because we have one foot over here and one foot over here. And in the middle, it's, it's all coming together and then it's going to, it's going to get more seamless and we're going to know where it's going a little bit more, but it's interesting. It's super interesting. I just kind of like, I put my anthropology, my Margaret Mead hat on and I'm like, this is super cool and interesting to watch happen. And when it comes to the art landscape, like watching like the crazy sales with the NFTs and everything like that, like that's definitely future, right? Like how is that going to shape or take form necessarily as the future mm -hmm. progresses? I think we're going to find out pretty fast from the way things evolve nowadays. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm just excited to see where it goes right now. It's just a lot of work to keep up with everything because we have, you yeah. know, we're in two different eras of human existence at once. So, um, but we're going to be fully in the future, but we'll see where that's at. All right. Oh, very, Sorry. very cool. Um, Any of that makes sense? <laughs> no, it, it makes total sense. And, and the reason I was like, Thinking about anthropology, if I had if I had known that before, I'm like I'm trying to think digging into my anthropology memories. I'm like, hmm, maybe I ask a good angle anthropology question. Um, but you bridged it already uh, pretty nicely. Um, no, that that it's very exciting to me. Uh, this whole this whole landscape, this whole scene, and I think one thing that's helped me out is looking at this online media creation. You know, everybody being their own media personality in a sense. Um, I think what's helped me, um, before I even, even get to what, what helped me, let me check with you. With how important is it for artists to not, maybe not embrace it, but at least understand what's going on with this media landscape? I mean, do, what do you say to people who are just like, well, I just want to paint? What do you say to those people? You know what? If you just want to paint, then just paint. Like, it just depends on what your goals are, you mm -hmm. know? Like, that's the same thing I tell my clients is I, I ask them, like, well, what's your goal, you know? Yeah. So if you if you want to be, like, crazy successful, it's going to be crazy important. 
if you use your art as your own therapy and you just want to paint paintings and or draw and give them to your friends and family, then you're golden. You know, you don't need to really worry about it. But it just really depends on what your goals are. And then you just got to, you know, adjust your time and research and energy to how to get to those goals. Yeah. And uh, I said those people like a kind of a disparaging way, but I didn't mean it like that. Um, Definitely. I've had discussions with a lot of people and I think there's a lot of pressure that goes on. People think that, oh, I have to have an Instagram with, you know, 50,000 followers. I have to do, um, you know, Twitch. I have to do Twitter and all this. I'm like, not necessarily. I think that it's a wonderful opportunity for you to uh, reach out in different ways. I think it's a wonderful opportunity to um, spread your influence and your message in different ways. But I, I never want to put out there that you have to do this kind of branding or you have to even show your face. Um, I know plenty of people out there killing it on the Internet that really never show their face. They just show their art, little caption or whatever. Um, and it's their own thing. So I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm just loving where we are right now. And I think that's an important thing for art to understand the environment that's around you and channel the different energies into your experience and then put it out there in some way for the people. So I don't know if that makes sense. I think right now it's important to remember to be flexible because everything is changing so fast. Don't, feel like you need to jump full into one thing and and get submerged in it because it's going to change and it's going to go away right it's like there's going to be some new hot thing happening so fast that you know just be flexible be but be sure to like know what's going on and take advantage of what's there but you know remember to be flexible and be fluid in what you're doing absolutely so with my um and getting back to what I was saying about how I, um, in my head, started to view social media online, um, I started actually taking this online communication as a form of art in itself. Uh, if you've seen my Facebook uh, post, I stopped posting links because people would argue over links and it was just getting annoying to me. Uh, I stopped posting a lot of pictures of my of wherever I was at and whatever I was doing. And it became almost like a little art project to say, I wonder if I can get someone's attention and, you know, get a little spark from them just by posting under like a a Twitter sized, you know, post small, small thing to get somebody thinking in the morning and one emoji. And I've kept that going for a couple of years now. And it just became kind of my artistic way of putting things out on Facebook. And I've kind of extended that to Twitter Instagram, where it's like, hmm, I have this thought, let me use my artistic creativity for that medium. You know, it may not be a canvas, but it's like Instagram. It's like Facebook has its own little medium and et cetera. So that's how I started viewing it. And by doing that, I became a lot more comfortable with the whole online media thing. And I think it's worked out for me uh, pretty well. I'm no longer having anxiety issues and getting pissed off about what people say on the internet because everybody's pissed off. It seems everybody's pissed off on the internet for sure. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, yeah, I, think, I can't go. I was just going to say, I think it depends on like what your style is too. you know, like what are you comfortable with? Like, don't do anything you're not comfortable with. Like, what are you doing you know, if, if you're not comfortable, then it's not authentic and that's going to show through anyways. Right. Yeah, it definitely will. Um, but I like what you said earlier about the, the changes and being, being at least aware of all the changes that are going on because, um, you mentioned NFTs and I am a big researcher kind of, I've, I've got a project lined up but I, it's not the right time to release it yet. So we'll pro- probably see it more towards the end of the year. But you went ahead and jumped into uh, NFTs already and you created one. Um, Why did you decide to do that? I just wanted to see what the process was. You know, I was like, okay, well, I'll just do it and I'll see what the process is and how hard is it and, and what are the boundaries 
uh, or hurdles that are facing either the consumer. So I put on my marketing hat, right? So I'm like, what are the mm-hmm. boundaries or hurdles facing consumers or the artists on either side, right? And there was there was a few like key ones that I kind of noticed just as a as a marketing person, right? And I was like, okay, okay, I, I feel like there needs to be a few more steps to go within the whole NFT landscape. Um, before it gets to like a real solid foundation, kind of like where you look, it's, I think of it as the same thing as like looking at cryptocurrency, right? Cryptocurrency is like a, such a good reflection of just kind of everything going on right now. It's like, all over the fucking place. Nobody can figure it out of what's going to happen. Everybody's scared of it, but everybody wants to embrace it. Some people do. Some people don't. Some people say it's trash. Some people say it's a flash in the pan, but it keeps coming back. And then it keeps yeah. coming back stronger and it'll go away and then it comes back a little bit more stronger. Right. So that's, that's literally us like moving into the future era. That's yeah. like, exactly how I see it. <laughs> and so like, when you look at NFTs, it's like, oh my God, it's this thing. And you're like, well, it's really been around for a while. It's just that, you know, nobody really picked up on it. And then it's like, oh, some $80,000 thing got sold. And then, and then, you know, and then now it's off the map for a second and then it's going to come back and it's, it's going to get more organized, right? I keep talking to people who mm-hmm. are planning on opening up NFT galleries, which I think is a really cool idea. Um, I think there's a lot of problems when it comes to like, well, how are you going to manage that, right? Like we need some sort of software and and to go into place. I would love to have an art show in Dubai by sitting on my couch and just like letting somebody rent out my NFT to see if they can sell it and have a physical art show in Dubai where I'm just like on a screen like I am now and I'm like sitting on my couch like hey guys yeah this is my art you know but I don't have to leave like I think that's an amazing idea of what the future of art could be right Mm. yeah yeah not a lot of people have thought down uh well I haven't seen a lot of people thinking down that direction uh that actually reminded me of um Kanye West he when he did his art show um and for those of you who don't know, yes, he held a big art show uh, with some uh, sculpture type pieces and some very interesting art. But one of the funny things was, was he had his, his face basically sitting on an iPad or an iPad screen, rolling around the, rolling around the gallery on a, uh, a, I don't know, it was kind of like a unicycle looking thing, um, Segway kind of deal. So he, his face was rolling around as if he was in the gallery, but of course he wasn't there. He was just totally somewhere else. Uh, I don't know. Did you ever it's see that? the perfect artist move. I didn't see it, but I yeah. think it's the perfect artist move where it's like, you're really an introvert, but you want to be extroverted. So like you're there, but you're not. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm like, that sounds great to me. Yeah. And um, it, it reminded me too of, uh, of Warhol, who used to get into his get up so often that people would always say, oh, yeah, that's Warhol because he's wearing the, you know, the beret, dark glasses, jacket, and whatever. And after a certain point, he started sending out body doubles dressed like him to the to the galleries, to the events and uh, the galas and everything. So I was like, there it goes. It's uh, It's all happening now. We're seeing this again. This is great. Yeah, totally. It's just it's just the new form of it. Yeah, definitely. And everybody, everybody who's here watching, be sure you uh, check in, say hi. If you have any questions, you know, go ahead and post them up there. We'll get to them. Navy Montel, what's up? Sergio, Verona, Amonis, uh, we got Jehudi, Raf. We got Raf in the house. I'm so used to calling names by their profile name, you know, just because oh, I want to, yeah. you know, but Raf is here. I'm just going to call him Raf. Ted, uh, Creative KM, everybody, Butcher Reyes, uh, all of you, thanks for joining in. This is very awesome. You're uh, doing pretty well for the kickoff event here, Aubrey. Yeah, I don't know. I it's really it's just really weird for me with the premiere coming out because I always prep my clients for interviews, but I'm never the one being interviewed. I'm like being the interviewer, especially with the background mm. in journalism. So now I'm like, oh, this is so strange. Like this is what I put you guys through. I'm so sorry. Mm. <laughs> yes. So I hope now, I'm a good person oh, to interview. But- Absolutely, absolutely, and uh, definitely appreciate the your art in the background. Um, you know, I've been talking to people and saying, "Hey, one way to get people is to tell them you have art." And 
like when they're doing their lives or after they've done their presentation, like, hey, you have a blank wall in the background. You know, I could juice that up a little bit for you. And I've actually gotten some sales that way. So, oh, um, nice. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. So, yeah. It's my coziest place in the house. Instead of putting a breakfast nook here, I took it out and just made it my art space. Nice, nice. Yeah. So, um, and I don't want to forget the, I don't want to forget Beer City. Uh, I meant to actually lead off with that, um, but we'll get to that in one second. Um, in this digital space, where does the physical art sit with you? What, uh, how, does it, how does it fit into your overall plan, your movement? Um, I know you do digital art, you're doing the NFTs, you're doing the illustrations, um, you know, you're doing the, the beer art, uh, the murals. How does your physical art and paintings fit into all that? My physical art is kind of like my therapy, to be honest. So, mm -hmm. like, it kind of how people, like, garden to, like, find their zen. And I, like, this, this is my zen, you know? Like, it keeps yeah. me sane and it keeps me happy. It's just that sometimes I make a lot of it and I have extras so I need to do something with it so I'm like hey who wants to buy a painting <laughs> yeah um so I mean that's for, for me like when you let off saying like you know I have it that like, creation is your salvation um I actually have like a little poem I wrote when I was like 17 years old in my bathroom that I read every day um it's like a a, a good hymn can be like uh, a good book can be a bible a hymn or a rhyme can be uh, a rhyme can be your hymn and creation can be your salvation or something like that i don't know it's on my bathroom in the mirror but anyways it's just the idea that like you know it it really keeps me sane and it saves me and i i realize that i need to do it for me and myself and my internal peace <laughs> exactly I, I believe uh that's very important for artists too uh just to that creative energy when it flows people are asking me is your art inspired by games? And it's funny. I actually say, well, not really. It's, I use the pixelization as a way of thinking about life, you know, life being a game, but I'm not inspired by games. And then I start to get all artsy and weird on them with my discussions. And then they either run away or they kind of start taking notes. Like, Hmm, this guy's really weird. Um, I love those discussions, by the way. And I think it's my favorite when people just run the other direction. I'm like, sweet, yeah. okay, cool. Sweet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a certain class of people that I really appreciate. Um, and I'll have these art shows where people come through, they're taking pictures. And then it may be, it's usually some older lady who's been around the art scene a while, who has these really rich and fascinating thoughts about art and visuals and life and connections that will stop and ask me, it's like, so when you were doing this, why did you choose the blah, 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 and the composition and the characterization? What does it mean for you? And the title is interesting and she'll go on and on and on. And I, I cherish those moments and I almost feel that I continue to do my art because I pick up those moments a couple times a year and it really just keeps my energy going. I, you know what? I love when I get approached like that and people ask me like what something means. And I'm like, you know what? I'm actually more interested in what you think it means. And I love hearing people's interpretation of my art. And yeah. then I always just tell them that's exactly right. Yes, exactly. You know, I've actually uh, changed some of my art before because it kind of veered people too far in one direction. They're like, oh, yeah, the, the guy who blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, mm, mm, I, don't, I don't like that. I don't like that interpretation. <laughs> I got to alter it a little bit to make sure that we're not getting too much nonsense interpretation from my art. Um, not nonsense, but in my head, it's different from what they have. So it doesn't make sense to me that they would oh, think man, that. I think, so I like to keep my meanings kind of to myself. So I really mm -hmm. love just letting other people's like interpretations go i'm like you know what you run with that that's what that's what it is now go for it i awesome. usually every art show i change the names of my artwork too so it's never the same <laughs> like who who did that um there's this artist i'm trying to think of a classic artist who did that i, I shouldn't say classic maybe he was um shortly after the cubist period or something um but he changed his name quite often 
And on the back of the painting, you would just see a title scratched out and then one above that. And then that title scratched out and another above it. And I was like, that's so awesome. Because when people like post the description of his art on the back, it'll, it, on the description, it'll say previously, you know, titled this, 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 and this, and this currently titled, and then the current title. So I just love I, that. I idea. don't know who that is, but as soon as you find out, let me know because me and that ghost have some talking to do. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. So um, that's how you're, you know, you use it as a, as a therapy of way of working. I'm glad that you connected your personal art with your professional art and your outgoing media art creative personality. I think you've got a great little whirlwind of energy going on um, because like you said, when you're switching hats and I'm, be I'm becoming better at that now, the whole switching hats kind of thing, where it's I'm going to marketing mode, the media mode, the graphic design mode, etc. cetera. Um, and I think that's uh, extremely important, and I'm glad that you mentioned that. So how did the Beer City thing come to be? Um, the do there's a documentary. Uh, actually, let them know a little bit about it. I'll let you kind of expound on that. Oh, no, you expound on it. What is it? You tell me. Oh, well, this isn't your personal art, so I can't just have a, <laughs> well, art means this and be beer. To me, beer means, you know, um, <laughs> it's it's weird. So you're, you're a very sociable. Okay, I will try something here. You're a very sociable, outgoing person. So it makes sense to me that Andrew, Andrew, a bubbly personality. So it makes sense to me that you would kind of hook up in this whole, you know, craft beer model of um, creativity. And, you're, you know, you're telling a different story through the art that you put on these beer cans for. Um, is Beer City also the name of the place? The location? So, so OK, so Beer City just kind of refers to San Diego in general or other beer cities, cities that are known for their beer culture. Right. Mm -hmm. So San Diego is one of them. It's a it's a craft beer mecca. We have over 150 breweries in San Diego, which is crazy, by the way. I know everybody in San Diego is very used to this concept, but not most places around the world have like yeah. kegerators in their offices and everybody <laughs> goes to a brewery yes. for lunch. Like it's just not a thing. Right. Like this is very San Diego thing. So it's very mm -hmm. much a craft beer mecca. And um, I was really fortunate to be able to kind of like kind of grow up as a from like a 21 year old person to like now in the craft beer scene and and go from like more marketing to more artists and basically I I just gained a really big appreciation for people who are in the brewing community and the brew culture and it's it's an art of its own you know in the same way that we have you know chef's table documentaries about chefs and their food and where they get it, where they are sourcing their ingredients, what, how they're plating it, what's the story, plates, all those things. Beers also have those stories, you know, like it, when you go into craft beer and it, when you're mm -hmm. working with a good brewer, those stories are there, they exist. And it's just getting to know them and asking the right questions and figuring out what they are. And so for me, it, Beer City is um, it's it's any city of comprised of people who love and appreciate beer, and San Diego is one of the top ones for that. So we uh, we kind of got together and we made the documentary, which we'll get back to how that kind of came about as well. Okay. Um, but we made the documentary as kind of an ode to craft beer, as well as really like it takes my perspective as an artist to say like, hey, these people are artists too. This is why they're artists. This is why we should appreciate this product more on a level than just, oh, it can get us drunk, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, it, it's artistry and it really is. And I just really want people to kind of see it that way as well. And also talking about co-creating, you know, like I, I wrote up this whole thing uh, a while ago about and kind of came to the realization while I was writing this crazy rant out um, that it it's kind of my job to visually interpret their 
art on flavor, right? So it's my job to like taste a beer and then be like, okay, what would this look like visually? So that people who are used to consuming art visually can also consume art with their sense of taste, right? But we have to kind of lead them down that road a little bit, right? It's interesting. So this is my whole like thesis rant. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I realize that's kind of my job is to be like this weird artistic interpreter, right? So that we can take something that people are used to devouring art with, which is our eyes, and just start using our mouth instead, which sounds kind of weird, but we'll just skip over that. <laughs> no, um, that's a very interesting thing. I mean, you know, art and um, and beer, alcohol is is it's a weird little mixture of um, it, it's it's something that this pair they pair well together. So uh, I didn't I didn't even think about you know someone coming in and tasting a beer and really getting a sense of what it means to them and then producing a producing beer imagery out of that. And um, by the way, uh, I'm going to ask you this question right now. Um, tell, I need to know some beers that you like. Uh, you know, people in the comments, I want to know favorite beer, uh, any beer that we should be on the lookout for. Post them in the comments. I want to see what you got to think, what you guys think. Um, for me, uh, I used to I used to really get into some of the uh, Stella. That was one of my go tos. Um, I like the uh, uh, what's the one with the pink elephant? Delirium. I used to really like delirium. Yeah. Yeah. And when I. Gateway beer. Yes. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) And getting into the beer scene in San Diego, I, I, at first I thought the IPAs were garbage. I was like, what is this? Why is anyone drinking this? This is a bit too much. And over time, I think I was, I was eating a, a really heavy pizza with somebody and they had uh, an arrogant bastard ale. And it was like, oh, wait, this is this is starting to click in my head. Something's happening. I'm enjoying this beer now, this crazy hoppy taste. And next thing I know, I'm at the Stone Brewery. I'm hanging out at art, uh, art and craft beer events. Um, and it became a thing. So now I'm kind of on the I like the Stones. Um, their IPA selection as well. So th- that's, that's kind of, that's kind of my lane. Um, where, where are you at with this? With your beer taste? Oh God. Okay. So, <laughs> so on that note, before I talk about my beer taste, I just do want to mention that like your story of like tasting IPA and be like, Oh God. And then tasting it more. I just actually learned yesterday from a brewer that the bitterness and the hops, actually dries out your tongue which kind of forces the consumer to want to drink more of it because it dries out because the bitterness and the hops dries out your tongue so that's what keeps you reaching for it is it's actually like this weird scientific thing that makes you want to keep drinking more um mm. y'all yeah, learning it something just gets used to it. yeah no it's crazy right <laughs> um mm-hmm. but okay so my taste in beer uh my question for people are always what is your gateway craft beer um, so, like, for you, it would have been the Arrogant Bastard, right? Um, to to really be like, oh, like, this is craft beer and then got you into it more. Um, so, for me, I was at a punk rock party and this guy was outside really sad and I just saw him and I was like, oh, you look like you need someone to talk to. So, I sat down on the curb and I talked to him and he had a Fiend of Moon, which is a, a Belgian-style uh, beer, you know, similar-ish to Delirium. And I tried it and I was just like, wow, this is really good. I don't know what the fuck I'm drinking, but this is really good. And from then on, I, I really loved Belgian beers. I really got into that. Any beer with a cork in it, fucking pop it, pinkies up, we're drinking it, right? I was down. <laughs> and, uh, and then I was like, I only like beers with corks in them. Ugh. Um, so, <laughs> and then I saw the branding for Amplified and I was like, oh my God, I could do so much with them. And I ended up working with them just kind of like universe serendipitously. So weird. Um, and then I went to my first craft beer festival. It was the San Diego Brewers Guild Fest. And I was with our brewer, which means when you're with the brewer, it, it means that those little tags on your wrist that say you can only have 10 tasters, those don't matter. So I tried probably 40 different beers in a single day and totally blew out my palate. And then ever since literally that one day, I was just like, oh, I've now developed a palate for craft beer. 
And for like, you know, super hoppy stuff, whether it's a, or if it's a light lager or if it's a Roush beer, which is a smoked malted beer, like I was just like, oh, I like it all. You know, obviously it has to be like good though. Like I'm, I'm really sensitive to any off flavors. I'm pretty sensitive to adding sugars, sugary stuff in beer, whether it's like marshmallows or Twinkies or cinnamon toast crunch or all the other stuff that people are adding in a beer now. <laughs> um, I, I appreciate it. It's very creative. I, you know, I appreciate the nostalgia. I think it's really awesome. Um, but I can only, I can only drink like a little bit of it because I'm not a sugar person. Even when I was a kid, I'd go trick or treating and give the the candy away. It was just more of a competition thing. Um, but yeah, so my taste in beer is really just like, is it a good, well made beer? And then I can I can kind of always find an appreciation on some level for that beer. Um, it just kind of has to be good, if that makes sense. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, I think uh, you know a lot of people. It, it, art, beer, and anything that has a craft to it, uh, I think there's a very, there's a basic, you know, baseline at some point where you understand what the high end is like, and you understand what the low end is like, and you can say, no, that's a very good basic whatever. Um, yeah. you know, I knew my, fr my friend, he would go to this little diner and get a cheap cup of coffee, and he was like, you know what, they actually care about their coffee even though it's cheap and very simple so i you know i get the idea of you know having that baseline is it good so i definitely appreciate that um let's see we've got uh somebody raf said firestone uh somebody said golden chaos red stripe heine that's always a good one a little heineken in there um I, i'll actually uh throw back a, a past every once in a while i get a little blue ribbon just to remember the old days <laughs> yeah i mean all, all those macro breweries you know they people kind of hate on them a little bit but realistically it takes a lot of skill and talent to create something on that mass size very consistently when you're using ingredients that are slightly unpredictable so mm. you know props to them yeah yeah uh that is one thing the the scale of production and maintaining a uh, certain quality is certain um consistency and flavor is definitely an art in itself so oh yeah. yeah yeah i mean could you imagine like trying to produce a huge painting exactly the same every single time like that would be insane like how would you even do that without machines and, and doing it for you right yeah yeah that's a yeah, it's it's a thing now um and speaking of like painting i you know, I have a process now where I, you know, I mix my paints. Um, I use certain mediums and, and filler agents to kind of get a certain consistency. If it's too cold or it's too humid, then I know my paint is going to dry differently. So it becomes this whole process of figuring out what your process is. And it's just amazing to me because I don't, I don't traditionally think of beer the way as deeply as you do. And I just love seeing the parallels that you've um, built from your love of this this beverage and the way it matches with your art, the way it matches with your marketing and creativity, and so forth. It all it all just rolls in very greatly. That's a it, it's so excellent to me. It's yeah. I mean, it, it's all just from the pr perspective of seeing it as art. Yeah, and it all ties together. Yeah. So, uh, tell us about the. Uh, the beer city documentary itself yeah 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 okay so i told you i would tell you about how it kind of came about um i was throwing an event for amplified ale works where i work it was our anniversary party and i was taking total ownership of this party we sold it out it was great um i had seen like a, a guy walking by in the hallway and he's like oh hey what's up and i was like hey i have this party do you want to come i have four vip tickets left they're 50 bucks want to go and he's like for craft beer and i was like yeah he's like i'm in san diego to drink craft beer and so i was like sick you want these tickets he's like yeah i was like okay sick let's go and um and then it turned out he's a huge craft beer lover and he's a producer and editor uh up in hollywood on a bunch of different uh you know productions and stuff from hbo you know a human being who's in the best bedroom right now working on something um 
but yeah, basically he was telling me what he did. And I was like, oh, if you want to do a TV show with, with drama in it, you know, the San Diego craft beer scene has tons of stuff going on and it gets pretty crazy, pretty wild. I was like, ha ha, that would make a good show. And I, uh, you know, ran off to go finish managing my event like you've seen me do a million times. <laughs> and I actually was going to be hopping on a tour with the band Western Settings uh, the very next day. So I had to shut down the event at like two o'clock in the morning, got home, showered, took a 30 minute nap, got to the airport, flew into Nebraska. They picked me up in their van. And then I was on tour with the band for the next two and a half, three weeks. And, uh, and in the middle of that, I got a text from this guy that I had like made this offhand comment about making a TV show about beer with, you know, during our weird conversation and then me flittering off away. Um, and he's like, Hey, so I went into this meeting and I had all these other ideas about like skateboarding and blah, 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 blah. And they didn't really like any of them, but I wanted to keep the conversation going. So I just pulled out like your comment as just kind of like a, you know, out of my pocket kind of thing, just as, just to say it. And they loved it. They loved that idea. So I think we need to talk. And I was like, oh, okay, sure. And then we just started talking and, you know, it evolved into um, we had like this production company that initially was interested, but they wanted to do kind of like a top chef brewer thing. And I remember at one point that someone made the comment of like, of somehow like long it took to brew a beer and what they would need as far as ingredients and equipment. And uh and one of the comments was, well, what if we just speed up the process of brewing? And I was like, <laughs> like, that's not, <laughs> I was like, I'm pretty sure if you could just speed up the process of brewing that everybody would have done that by now. And we would have 30 second beers coming out of your microwave because that would be more efficient and you'd make more money. <laughs> like, right, right. But that's just not how it works. And so they were very disappointed with that, uh, that comment. And, um, <laughs> realistically it just kind of showed how they didn't really understand beer culture and like really what me and and my partner in this whole project dave wadsworth uh were going for and we really wanted to show like how beer is a community and it uplifts itself and everybody in the beer community helps each other and we wanted to showcase that and we wanted to get that energy behind it and really show that you're not just drinking beer you're drinking something that's part of a community of people who really care about each other and each other's success and that's why in San Diego, we have such good beer is because everybody helps each other and they love each other and they support each other. And we really wanted that to come across. Have heart and soul. And that's kind of what we accomplished in that. And I also got a best friend out of it. So it's pretty cool. And I'm pretty excited to show the world. And I think it's something that if I had done it, I think it's pretty clear conversation probably would have way too deep and too esoteric and probably really boring for a lot of people um dave comes from like jackass fucking the osbournes all kinds of cool stuff so he okay. adds like the fun and the flavor and like the jokes to it <laughs> so yeah, yeah. he like makes it more entertaining and more interesting and and actually it wasn't even a thing that i was going to be in front of the camera for and then he kind of dragged me in front of the camera kicking and screaming to be a host because <laughs> it was, it just became a lot easier production wise for me to do it since I was going to be there anyways. And he was just like, oh, come on, I'll just do it. And I was like, fine, whatever. And there's like footage of me with like my hoodie on and glasses. And he's like, what the fuck are you doing? And, and I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> and then eventually I just, I, I was just, I put on my marketing hat and I was like, you know what? shut up artist Aubrey this just needs to happen right now to get this done so get in front of the camera and do the thing and say what we need to say put on your journalism hat and ask people the, the questions that we need to be answered by brewers and just do it just get it done and we did and um you know despite my kicking and screaming I think we accomplished something really cool and really fun that's excellent. That is excellent. And I do like the, the idea of just getting in there and, and doing it. Um, where can, so you know, I'm sure they'll get, they can get information from your page, but um, if they wanted to go find out a little bit about it right now, uh, what do they look for? Yeah. So you can head on over to beercitytv.com. Currently there it's really, it's just um, ticket sales because we are, premiering it at Casbah on August 5th, which is actually sold out now. Um, and Ballast Point picked it up to show the next night, August 6th, at Ballast Point in Miramar. 
So you can go to beercitytv.com to get tickets for that. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's really ridiculous. I sold out Caswell too. We should all laugh about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's excellent. Um, so I, I'm kind of laughing here because I have a friend who, uh, who for whatever reason, you know, he's all about Ballast Point, and he he has arguments with my other friend who hates that beer, and they just go back and forth. And w when I saw them going back and forth, I think my only input to the conversation was. Yeah, some pretty pretty neat art on the on the labels here. I kind of like what they're doing with the styling, and they're like, "Shut up, artist!" You know, I'm like, "Nah, man, it's fucking great." You know? <laughs> no, it, it's cool, right? So, like, to that conversation right there, exactly right. Whether you love or hate the beer, what you would learn by watching it is that no matter what, Ballast Point is completely influential within the craft beer scene in San Diego, and really brought it up to what it is now. So you can love, hate the beer, it doesn't matter. It's super important to the history of beer as a whole because San Diego has gone on to influence the entire world. So it it's influential and important whether you like the beer. And I also interviewed the artist, Paul Elder, which was a super interesting and entertaining uh, interview to do with somebody who's another like beer label artist and get their whole perspective on everything. That's excellent. That is excellent. Beer label artist. Um, the fact I mean, that, I don't know what do you say, like brewery artist, brewery artist. I think no, that's actually it, it. Actually, makes a lot of it. Actually, makes a lot of sense, and I'm kind of excited by the whole idea of it. And uh, I think you remember uh, there was a we had a little miniature conference call of a few creatives on on a on Facebook, and lo and behold, two beer label artists, uh, great friends of mine, you and uh, Alex Diffin, both showed up. And you're both like, you're a beer label artist, I'm a beer label artist. And my mind is blown. I'm like, how is this even possible? You know, that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, and then I remember we just kept talking and everybody's like, what, maybe you guys need to get your own phone conversation going. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's excellent. Well, very, very good. Very good. So um, I want to I wanna wrap this up. Is there, pretty soon, is there anything that you want to make sure that, um, you know, a message that you want to get across, you know, you're wearing the different hats. We covered a lot of areas here. Um, what do you want to leave people with? Or, you know, I think the biggest thing that I've learned is just uh, put your blinders on. Like, you know, you talk about like the digital landscape and marketing and all that stuff. And I think, I think it's really important to not worry too much about what other people are doing at the end of the day and really just stay focused on you and what you want to do and what you want to put in the, out into the world and how you want the world to perceive it or take it in. And uh, just put on your blinders, dude. Like, just just do your art. You know, it'll take you places if you want it to. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, we got a question here from Sergio. Would a beer label artist be considered a? I don't even know what this word is. Affichiste? 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 I don't know. Do I get to see these? I don't get to see these questions. Yeah, A F F I C H I S T E. Um, I don't know. I'll have to look that up. Yes. And, and yes, yes, <laughs> absolutely, uh, yes. 100%. Um, I'll look that up and, and tag you back in the comments, uh, all right. Sergio Pig, and we'll find out about that. That is an interesting one. See, I'm learning stuff all the time. That's why I love this interactive thing, you know? That is, and that is one great thing I got from all my convention outings, my, uh, you know, cons and expositions and things like that is just the – the rubbing up against awesome minds. That was the thing that kept me really going to a lot of these conventions. And I've cherished all the friendships I've made, all the things I've learned. Uh, they've all been major turning points for me just in different ways. So I am so glad that you uh, decided to come through, drop your knowledge, let us know what's going on here with the whole art scene, media scene, beer scene in San Diego. Um, how can people find you? Uh, you can follow me on Instagram, Tiny Nightmare. All right. So and basically, my, my handle for everything is Tiny Nightmare across the board. Thanks to the Nerdcore scene where Doc Ock actually gave me that nickname. And then he got mad I used it as a nickname because he's like, it wasn't supposed to be a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that guy's great. I miss him so much. We need to get beers with him. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I got a quick answer back from Sergio Pig. Um, would beer label artists be considered uh, affichiste? Let's scroll away. Affichiste? And affichiste, it's Italian. 
Um, and they're the dudes that made the poster art for concerts. Ah, you know, it's similar. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a product, right? So what you're doing is you're doing product art. So any type of packaging art really. Um, but a lot of people who have done poster artwork for like music and music and concerts and blah, blah, blah. Uh, they, they've done a lot of label art now at this point. So it, it very much goes hand in hand. I wouldn't say it's necessarily traditional, but it is, it's becoming a very popular thing to kind of go back and forth on that. Yeah, it definitely reminds me of that. I totally agree. Um, one day I'll have to tell you about the story where I, uh, I was at an art event and I was sitting next to Scrojo, but he wasn't promoting like a lot of his traditional art. Scrojo, who did all the art for the concert poster art that you see at like the Belly Up, uh, a lot of other places in San Diego and around the world, I guess. But I was sitting next to him and he was showing art that wasn't his normal style. It was just some other things he was doing. And we kicked it off and, you know, had a great conversation. And I was like, yeah, you ever see the art at the belly up? That's just great. Yeah, you should. Uh, and he's like, it's like, dude, did you see the subtitle to my card? You know, art by Scrojo. And I picked up his card again. And I'm like, eh, okay, it's right, it is right there in the bottom. So, yeah, maybe I'll uh, find a way to reconnect with him. It's been a while. And uh, get him on here. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. All right. Uh, there's a final question here before we get out. What is your favorite San Diego IPA? My favorite San Diego IPA. Oh, it's such a hard one to answer because I feel like they're constantly changing. Um, but currently, honestly, I'm really liking our own beer, which I feel is very self-serving, but it's also the truth. Uh, Stratocaster, is, it's just really good. These new hops, Strata hops, are really awesome. I really enjoy them. Um, so I'd have to say Stratocaster and Amplified right now is, is what I've been enjoying. Awesome. That sounds excellent. All right. Well, uh, that's all I've got for this one. Um, I think it's been a, a great and informative discussion. I'm going to go back and definitely think about some of these things. Um, I'll see. I'll, I'll see about putting some extra information in the comments a little later on. Um, this will be stored off on on my page, so you won't have to worry about it missing or going away anywhere. And uh, I'll definitely connect with you again soon. Okay, sounds good, Benja. It's good to talk to you. We need to hang out. I need to take you for beers, actually. It, what I've learned from this conversation is I need to take you out for beers. Yes, I think so. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's been a bit, and I haven't... I, when I left San Diego, the whole vibe left me. I, didn't, I couldn't find the same vibe, so that's what happened. Yeah. All right. All right, well, okay. come down. I'm sure you'll be at my premiere. So we'll yes, yes. Then. Awesome. <laughs> glad, glad you're still having the premiere uh, during the pandemic, still making it happen. I love it. Yeah, yeah. All right. I'll see you. All right. Take care. Bye. Ciao. All right. That was uh, Aubrey Miller, uh, better known as Tiny Nightmare of Beer City, of the Marrow, of uh, Nerdcore Nights in San Diego. Um illustrator, marketer, painter, has found a way to put all her awesome creativity, creative energies together and into this whirlwind of awesomeness that she is, as you found out. That's what we do here at BenjaCon. Th these are discussions that I've been having with people personally that I've never put online that I wanted to kind of bring to you. So make sure you're here for the rest of them throughout the week. Um, I have a full roster of people coming up soon, actually today, uh, be talking with Nastio, the 8-Bit Boy, who I mentioned, and Nerdcore. We have Holly Stacy, uh, a.k.a. Fern the Camper. We've got Jeff Junio from Sega, Raphael Phillips, uh, 3D artist and character developer. We've got Eddie P, um, marketer and strategist. Uh, we've got all kinds of people. But basically, this is all about art, design, and development, and putting your creative energy out there. I think we're in a place where we haven't really seeing what creatives can do. And now that we have all the media tools that were run by bean counters or whoever else, I think that we have a great opportunity here to connect with people, to put our information out there, to put our messages out there. So that's why I'm doing the whole internet thing. Thank you all for your time. Thank you all for coming through and be sure to check out the schedule and I will see you soon. Peace.